Good morning, good afternoon, and good day wherever you may be joining us from. Welcome to another edition of Sales TV Live. Today, we're looking to drive transformational oh, change. Hold on. The first one of 2024 is worth embracing that, isn't it? Yeah, this, this is true. <laughs> a, a new year, a new season. The first Sales TV Live of 2024. Uh, so, thank you for that, Adam. Uh, today, we are looking to drive transformational change by creating a movement. I'm joined by Greg Sattel. Greg is the author of the book, Cascades, How to Create a Movement that Drives Transformational Change, and co-founder of Change OS, a transformation and change advisory. Greg's research, first inspired by his experiences managing Ukraine's leading news organization during the Orange Revolution, helps Greg bring a unique perspective on driving transformation in business. Greg, welcome. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Love to have you here. Thank you for, for joining us. And, and uh, sorry for the technical snafus that delayed us, but you know, new year, new problems. <laughs> Everything happens in exactly its own time. That's right. So Greg, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Well, uh, I uh, I grew up in, in Philadelphia, and then I, I went to work in New York, and I was working in the in ad sales in New York, and uh, I got a strange offer to sell ads for a business journal in Eastern Europe, and this was 1997. I was 27 years old, and I had been an athlete in college, so I could never do a semester abroad. So I figured, well, I'll go out for six months, and you know, I, if if I if I don't do something like this now, I'll never do it. And uh, six months turned into 15 years, uh, and it really, you know, uh, took my life in in a very very different direction. I was, I was running media companies most of the time I was there. But what what I got to experience in just in terms of of large scale change in in a number of ways. First of all, in uh, during that time from 19 from the the late 90s where all of the countries in Eastern Europe were switching systems from a communist system to a capitalist system and it was just a uh, a societal transformation almost in in sort of like time lapse photography it was just amazing and then at the same time uh, running companies i had to i had to to uh and also advising other companies i had to empower change within those organizations in order to compete and then all of these things as, as you pointed out came to a head in the orange revolution in 2004 when i learned that uh the world didn't quite work the way i thought it did and that uh large scale change was was possible on a level that i had never uh i i was i was never aware of Okay. Interesting. So let's jump right into it. With the new year often comes new resolutions on a personal level. Similarly, organizations use this time to launch new business plans. In your opinion, why do traditional change management exercises so often fail in organizations? So uh I think the, the fundamental fallacy is that people see the relationship between personal change and large scale change, transformational change, as the very similar to the relationship between sales and marketing. Right? If I want to, if I want to sell you a car, then we sit down and I, I, uh, I listen to your needs and I. Uh, I figure out the root cause of, of your needs and I uh, 
try and, and structure my, I use emotive language and trying to persuade you by showing the, the benefits of this, making this particular purchase. I, I overcome objections and eventually I, you know, hopefully close that sale. So I think there is a, there's a, an assumption that large scale train, change, transformational change is just that very same process scaled up. So, you know, uh, instead of me telling you the benefits, maybe uh, doing a social media campaign or a TV campaign or, or, or whatever it is. But that's not true at all. In, in, in Transformational change isn't about persuasion. It's about group dynamics. Because when we're talking about actually changing behaviors, that's very, very different than changing, I don't know, uh, among, you know, three, three different car brands that, that you might choose. And the best, uh, the best indication of what we think and do or what the people around us think and do. So it's much more about sequencing. So I could, for example, say, uh, Rob, I want to convince you of this particular thing that, I don't know, you shouldn't eat bacon, right? <laughs> um, or you should, I don't know, shouldn't eat meat, whatever it is. Uh, and you might walk away from that, from that conversation persuaded. But if you go back to your family and friends and everybody's scarfing down meat, chances are once you get back embedded with those social networks, your, your behavior is going to conform. And we know this because we have decades of research that tells us this. And it tells us that the effect it, uh, is, is uh, we can see the effect even in third degree relationships. So not, not just our friends, and the friends of our friends, but the friends of our friends' friends are influencing us in ways that uh, that we're often not not aware of. That's one thing that that basic misunderstanding of what the task is. The second is is that when we ask people to change what they think and what they do, there's going to be resistance. People was you know not everybody is going to like your idea and some are going to hate it and they're going to work to undermine it in ways that are dishonest and underhanded and deceptive so the first job the first thing you should be thinking of is how you're going to navigate that resistance but if you look at if you look at typical change management schemes whether it's uh, John Cotter, or whether it's uh, ADCAR, they don't say anything about resistance. Nothing. You know, John Cotter's eight steps, not one of them talks about overcoming resistance. ADCAR, um, we, you know, it talks about uh, awareness, desire, knowledge. That's selling. That's persuasion. It doesn't mention anything about overcoming resistance. They have some module deep, if you, if you look in the in the uh, if you look at, at the ADCAR website and you you search for overcoming resistance, you can find something about it. But even that only applies to rational resistance. Often the resistance is irrational because we uh, we all form attachments to people, ideas, and other things. And when those attachments are threatened, we tend to lash out. We feel it offends our de identity, dignity, and sense of self. So if we're not dealing with that, if, we do, if we're not building strategies to navigate and overcome that, chances are we're not going to be very successful. So I heard you say transformational change is very different from the, the simple change that I, I might want to, to make. Um, it's not a, it's just a matter of, of scaling it up. Well, then, how does one go about creating a transformative change? Now, 
by the title of this episode alone, I, I know the answer is create a movement. So help us understand that a little bit more. What do you mean by creating a movement? Well, movements are about empowerment. When I say I want to persuade you, I want it's I, I want to I want to make you do something in in some way. Either I'm going to give you some sort of incentive, or I'm going to make some sort of argument that says, "Rob, you're doing it wrong. You should be doing it a different way." That's a difficult conversation to have. Because you probably think you're doing it right. <laughs> um, on the other hand, if I would seek to empower you and uh, and say, hey, Rob, I see you're, this thing is, is really, really important to you. Um, and I want to help you be successful. And Adam says, you know, I see Rob. He's really successful with this idea. I want to find how he does that. And, um, and Adam, he has a few friends who said, what are you doing over there with Rob? And they say, they say, all of a sudden you're starting to build, um, just by power of, of your example, uh, which is why we say, uh, change is always about small groups, loosely connected, united, by a shared purpose. When we look at a viral cascade, and the network science tells us this, uh, if you think about a wave at a stadium, think about how that happens. People go to the stadium in, uh, in uh, uh, small groups. You know, they go with a buddy or maybe their family or whatever. And they get loosely connected because, of course, they're sitting with each other and they're all watching the same thing. And when that crowd is triggered, we can see this massive collective behavior where they're doing a wave at a stadium. But we know how that works. So nobody says, well, you just get a bunch of people in a stadium and, and they'll start making these waves. It's not exactly how it happens. But people do say... Um, well, let's have a big kickoff meeting and get a bunch of people in the room. Uh, that's not how change works. Change works at the, it's always those tight um, bonds among small groups and those groups influencing each other that creates that cascading behavior. I'll give you a very, very real world example. In 1998, my friend Serja Popovich, he met with uh, four of his friends in a cafe. And they decided that they were going to overthrow, uh, they were going to bring down the regime of Slobodan Milosevic, who was the, the authoritarian dictator running Serbia at that time. And the next day, uh, six of their friends joined them. So that those were the original 11 uh, founders of, of Otpor. About a year later, they this movement, it led, it, it was about uh, two, maybe 300 people. And anybody who watching Serbia at that time would have to conclude that Milosevic was going to be dictator for life. A year later, the movement had grown to uh, 70,000 and uh, they and M M Milosevic was overthrown and on his way to The Hague. And that's how it always looks like. You have these small groups. They start getting connected. Um, it hits a tipping point, And all of a sudden we get this exponential growth. I can tell you another example at Procter and Gamble that was almost exactly the same. An overthrow at Procter and Gamble? In a way, yeah. There was uh, there was this guy who uh, he won an award. I still don't know exactly. It was some super secret problem he solved, and he uh, and 
after winning this award, he he told the CTO, "Hey, why don't you let me do this on a on a company wide basis? Create this this sort of movement for process improvement." And he was just a middle manager. He was thirty five at the time, and as uh, and as this was was starting, cascades came out. And he followed the steps in my book, Cascades. And within 18 months, his movement in Procter & Gamble, which today is called PXG, was up to 2,500 people. And today, this is four years later, it's more than, well, last time I checked in the fall, it was more than 60,000. So wow. that's what's possible. So, so I, I have a genuine question here. So I get that if um like the the uh, the overthrow of slobodan um milosevic milosevic thank you um i i get that um this is something that you feel really passionate about so when i come to you and i say look i think we need to depose this dictator you say okay i can get on board with that what are we going to do because i feel like i'm one of the french resistance you know, and I'm I'm kind of working in the underground for for the greater good, um, and but a lot of things where uh, you you have a very ironclad rationale for why you need to do something, um, but it requires you to do something you don't like. So I'm thinking about this from our own perspective. Uh, you know, we train people to use social media to have more conversations, which ultimately lead to commercial interactions with people. But for them to do that, they need to do a whole host of things that they don't want to do. So they have to put themselves out there. They have to share personal stuff. Uh, they have to be more outgoing. They have to publish more content, all of those things that people are normally quite resistant to. And even when they themselves uh see the the results of their success uh they find it hard to um to maintain that behavior let alone convince other people and another example of this might be quitting smoking or losing weight or whatever it is uh you know it, it's very easy to find a group of people and you know that it's in your best interest to do this thing and yet because it's going against something that you don't want to do you know i like smoking therefore i don't want to stop um I like burgers, therefore I don't want to cut down on the number of burgers I eat. I like selling stuff and making lots of lots of uh, commission. Therefore, I, I, I know that if I do some of this stuff, I'll be able to do more of that. Um, but it requires me to do something I don't want. How, how do you overcome that? Well, okay, I'm going to give you two answers. One of them isn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> the first uh not very good answer well it actually is a good answer it's just not going to satisfy you there's a book called immunity to change by uh, keegan and Leahy that's excellent about that it's it's more of a more of the type of resistance you're talking about they call it there is a a competing um not incentive but a competing commitment Right. So right. you may you might want to you might want to um, stop smoking, but you're really, really committed um, to that, you know, that time when you're sitting smoking and thinking and and whatever you do, that sort of meditative um, process. They have an example in the book, for example, of of a guy who wanted to lose weight, but he in his Italian family, that Sunday dinner was super important. Yeah. So, uh, or a a manager that uh, wants to delegate, but also likes to see herself as as hands on and yeah. and not overhead. So those are all important. Uh, you know, you you can see how that would would get in the way of you making those changes. And Keegan and Leahy uh, have a, a wonderful methodology for doing that and helping teams do that with large scale transformation you simply can't you know if, if like the procter and gamble example you, you can't have that conversation with sixty thousand people you just can't yeah um so what we do when we sit down with a 
and organization. Uh, one of the first things we do is we lay out a resistance inventory. So my research has, has uh, identified five different categories of resistance. So lack of trust, uh, competing incentives or commitments. Uh, competing incentive is external. Competing com commitment is internal. So you're paid for one thing and you're being asked to do something else, for example. For instance, uh, one, uh, uh, one person I, I talked to, he, he, he was a C CIO and he was being... Uh, his bonus was based on the division heads adopting new systems, but the the division heads their compensation was based on uh, increasing margins. So there's there's obviously a conflict there. Right? Um, the third is uh, change fatigue, which uh, obviously you know is 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 probably worse since COVID, but was certainly there before COVID. So we know uh, PwC did a study back in, I think, 2014 or something, and they found that about two thirds of employees are experiencing some kind of change fatigue. Um, there are switching costs, which are always there. So those are the four rational um, reasons people resist change. So what we do is we think about who's going to resist in, in, in those ways. Uh, what form will that resistance take and what strategies can mitigate it? You know, if people don't trust us, how do we build trust? You know, uh, are there competing incentives? And just going through and anticipating them and building strategies before they happen rather than just waiting until they happen. That's that can be incredibly helpful. And of course, the last one is identity, dignity, and sense of self that uh, you're probably never going to change those people. Hmm. But the, the crucial thing to understand about change is that, and I always laugh when, when I'm watching, uh, when there's this like big launch event and they show the S-shaped curve because Everybody knows because of decades of research that change follows an S-shaped pattern where, you know, it, it, it starts off slowly and then it hits an inflection point and uh, accelerates exponentially. Um, but if you know that's true, why are you doing this big launch event? <laughs> it doesn't make any, any sense. We, we know from the same body of research that that tipping point for an organization tends to be between 10 and 20 percent. So that's why we're we're that's where we're trying to get to that 10 to 20 percent level. We don't have to 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 convince everybody at once that that 65 percent, two thirds that are experiencing change fatigue, we can leave them alone and that, you know, 15, 20% that, you know, has an issue with identity and hates this change. We don't need to bother them. We just need to get to that 10 to 20% tipping point where we can start scaling. And that's really the secret to, to uh, large scale change. Because if you're having that big kickoff meeting, yeah, you're going to, to get some people excited, but you're going to trigger those at the other end long before you're you, you've built traction and that's one reason why change often fails that explains a lot so bob Britton shares with us and and thank you bob for for commenting behavioral shifting is different because people are not machines they always have a choice to do or not do something absolutely yeah absolutely true so greg what are the first steps an organization should take when they decide to create a movement for change, especially in a sales environment. Sounds like the sales kickoff ain't it. Find people who want it to happen. Okay. I, I mean, rather than saying, hey, we just decided that, that the world is, is changing and we made a, we're making a bunch of new rules 
and all of you people are going to have to live by them. A much better strategy is to say, hey, Rob and Adam, they're really excited about this. Let me go help them succeed. Um, and, and when people see that success, then we start spreading that success. You, the first thing you want to do is get out of the business of selling an idea and into the business of selling a success. Uh, so you want to shrink the change down to one team, you know, one product, one whatever, make it successful and start, you know, and then start spreading it. But, you know, the first thing is, I mean, we all know that you should do a pilot, right? If, if you're launching a new product, you don't, you know, you, you don't go from, from prototype to, you know, okay, let's, you know, you, you do some testing and we want to do that with change as well. We want to, uh, you know, you, you want to do some keystone changes and, uh, show that this change can work or at least that you can make it work because quite, quite often you're going to find that maybe the idea isn't quite right. Maybe, well, design thinking worked great in your old organization, but maybe maybe it needs to be implemented differently here. So while you're figuring that out, you want to figure that, that out with people who are enthusiastic about the change, who want it to work, not people that you have to convince. And I know we, we only have a few minutes left, but uh, that is one of the... Um, one of the most important things I learned in my research is that the urge to persuade is a red flag. It means hmm. that you uh, you have the wrong change or you have the wrong people. Uh, if you always want to start with the majority, right? That could be three people in a room of five. You can expand a majority out, but as long the minute you're in the minority, you're going to feel immediate pushback. Excellent. Well, great. This has been great. How can people learn more? Where can they get in touch with you? Uh, well, at my website, gregsatel.com, my, my blog, digitaltonto.com. Uh, certainly my book, Cascades, and uh, I encourage everybody to uh, connect with me on, on LinkedIn. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Uh, for Adam and myself, Greg, thank Brilliant. you very much. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Audience, thank you for actively participating. This has been another edition of Sales TV Live. Uh, to our audience, on behalf of our guests and everyone else at Sales TV Live, we thank you for being an active part of today's conversation. And we'll see you next time.